All right, so we're recording. All right, I'm first here. So I thought this is bloody awesome. Um, this is the details of reverse engineering the vaccine and the virus. And you know, this is something I heard, but I was glad to learn more about it, is that China released the DNA of the virus in like January of this year, and that was all they needed. And they said they had the vaccine within like two weeks, and all this reigning time has been testing it. So here they explained it. They released a genetic sequence of the virus, which is eight kilobytes. It's the entire virus. And it's just these four amino acids. And one thing you'll notice is that U is turned into phi or psi or whatever this Greek letter is, because uh, for some reason you can't use the real, if you use the real U, something bad happens. So they use something else when making uh, um, vaccines. And that way it folds correctly. Because if it doesn't fold correctly, it won't work. Anyway, so that's the point. Once they had this, all they had to do was to print out the source code. You have the cap on the five prime end and the other prime is the, the other end of the, the RNA sequence is the three prime end. You just print this in a DNA printer, like a 3D printer. That's how you make it. And then you manufacture more of it by multiplying it. So here's the actual untranslated region. And you know, this, here's this fire psi or whatever this thing is. And uh, they talk about this. If, you're, if you don't use a fake um, amino acid here, your body regards it as a foreign thing and kills it. But by translating one of the amino acids into a different thing, your body does not recognize it as foreign. So they can sneak things into your body, past oh. your defenses. And so then um, they talk about how they made this thing and they had to do another adjustment where these exclamation points are. This is the spike protein, which is the active ingredient <laughs> which is what it targets. And they had to make replacements where the exclamation points are to make it work. And uh, anyway, it's fun to watch. Here's the actual spike protein and the places where they had to change a few things. Then you just print it up. So the, and so here's the actual um, uh, COVID-2 virus with the spikes. And the spikes are the active ingredient that it latches onto you and causes the problem. So they target the spikes. And that is the part just like antivirus for computers, that's the part that they can't change without ruining its functionality. So they targeted that. And that's why when it mutated in Britain and they said, there's this new one around, most of the experts said, oh, don't worry. It'll be affected by the vaccine as well because we targeted the part that can't really change much. So anyway, we'll see how it goes. But I was quite happy to see such a good explanation of it. It's not that complicated at all in many ways. And and very cool. And that's why I've heard a lot of people say that the great thing about this is not only do they have a good vaccine for coronavirus, but now they have a whole new technique to pump out vaccines for future viruses really fast, which does look pretty much true. So anyway, that's, I thought that was wonderful. That's I mean, promising for the future. Yeah. 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 I mean, this, this is, this is where the real value comes from these, these large scale uh, engineering projects, uh, be it, you know, biological or industrial. Um, yeah, you sure you get this product out that you need like right away, but down the road, you now have all these techniques that you can apply and just create entire new industries out of. Absolutely. Which is, you know, I hear often, this is why they justify the space race. It's mm -hmm. not that you exactly care about putting someone on the moon, but there's all these great things you develop on the way. Yeah. So I'm glad to see it. And then, yeah, how do I love this? They want to use your browser history. How are they going to get your browser history? Like what the uh, hell? Uh, yeah, the what the hell indeed? What could go wrong? So, uh, essentially, they have. I mean, and if you if you read the paper, it's more of a high level overview of how they would do this. But um, we already know that there are numerous ways uh, that where um, companies do data tracking on us and then just sell all the information. So, uh, I would say that, and in fact, I just did a research study on this um all the information's out there uh and and already being brokered and sold so it's trivial all they have to do is uh you know subscribe to uh you know unlimited consumer data sets ltd's service and then they get everyone's uh data but their argument here is that um Essentially, they're co comparing and contrasting between hard data and soft data, and they consider the browser history and online activity logs and stuff like that to be soft data. And their um, their uh, <laughs> their their argument is that um, 
uh, systems that are relying on hard data are more uh, cyclical and risk prone and prone to failure than if you're taking into account the soft data too and using that to inform your um, decision making as to whether get somebody so whether somebody gets a loan or whether they get a mortgage or what their interest rate is going to be and um, mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a this is a, a terrible idea wrapped in more terrible ideas. I mean, but the way that our laws are, there's nothing to prevent them from doing this. It makes um, me think that the people are right that you should be using DuckDuckGo and get a VPN and all that stuff. Right. Even then, though, I mean, the way that the way that our uh, what's really disturbing to me is the way that. Um, Couple things. First off, that how easy it is to de-anonymize uh, so-called anonymized or sanitized data. Um, most of it, like in the 90s, 90, 90th percentile and up, uh, can be re-identified easily. Right. Second of second is uh, that um, uh, the the way that this data is aggregated. Um, there are already these companies, these shady companies that are aggregating multiple different data sets collected from um, different online services and, um, you know, businesses that you may, whose services you may use, uh, stuff like that, and essentially selling these um, dossiers on consumers that have uh, a ton of information that's been um, collated and put together on you and then uh, I mean when you start applying various uh, machine learning implementations to that I think the effects can be pretty um, pretty far-reaching and I, what I worry about now is uh, you know we're sort of ushering in a new uh, if we if we implement stuff like this we're sort of ushering in a new area of digital redlining um, what's redlining isn't great. So redlining was the practice of um, banks to refuse to uh, <coughs> mortgages for black people so that they could not purchase real estate in certain parts of towns. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think that's the thing about machine learning. I mean, the reason why I think people are bigots is because it's like what happens with the most casual inspection of the data and machines just fall into the same trap. Exactly. Because it was the, the, these, algorithms were designed by the racist people that you know all of our biases are reflected within within the uh the machine learning yeah well so. i think also there's just an effect on the data if you have a group of people and you deny them education and deny them jobs and make them live in a terrible people then they are low on accomplishments later you can see it there they're just inferior it's like a self-perpetuating thing yeah anyway. that too so hopefully, hopefully uh, we move away from this, though I am not optimistic. <laughs> well, there was that financial company we talked about a couple times ago, this new financial company that doesn't track you or estimate the risk at all. They just give you a payment schedule. And if you don't make it, then you can't use them anymore. That's it. So they cut past all this. And that's another option. Another thing I wonder is if you could advertise your service and say, we don't rely on tracking your, invading your privacy to run our service. And this is really a selling point like dolphin safe tuna. Sure. Sure. It'd be another Absolutely. way to go. Anyway. So Irvin, you got the DHS. Oh, China spying on us. Yeah. I remember this one. There's a, there's a back and forth going on about this. Oh yeah. So the DHS uh, security secretary made this big old speech that, the TCL is sending stuff over to China and, and uh, anything you do on it is, mm -hmm. is going out to them. Uh, but if you look at the TV itself, well, it's running on Android and it has, uh, if you can get into the TV, it doesn't require a password to connect to it. And I think there's another flaw about it. TCL did respond back to this saying we did find a vulnerability and we patched it already. Um, but we're not, we're not doing the whole, the whole evil under the sun that, that came out of that speech. So there's this, this, you know, back and forth shenanigans. I mean, the TV having a, a being internet connected and having no password is bad enough for me, no matter what manufacturer it is. You, the, why, why is this TV without a password? 
Yeah, well, right now, there seems to be a huge appetite to just block everything from China. But I think it would probably be more reasonable to just say, you can't send our data to China. Or maybe even, you can't do that without labeling on the box that you're doing that so people know. It's something I would think would be better. Or, you know, it's a TV. Don't have it connected to the internet. But well, you know, I hear what I know? say that, but the fact is everybody, I, I've, I've gone to other people's houses that have TVs and now they want to watch Netflix and uh, Amazon Prime and Disney Plus on their TV. You kind of need your TV connected to the internet now. Not yes, really. Yes. You can just use an Apple TV. Or, or a Chromecast or a Roku yeah. or, or other separate device you can unplug and, and when you don't want it. Yeah, uh, but, but, you know, those yeah, are the same people who want a smart toaster too. Right. But, but here's, here's, what, here's, here's the, the key component is that when you have internet connected TVs, you can deliver ads and Nielsen data uh, to customers reducing the price of the TV significantly. So now you can buy a huge big screen TV for like $250. It just connects to the internet and consumers love those cheap prices. That's true. Sure. But yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I think, uh, I think that Caitlin's got the point. I think what really matters is the cheap price and Americans really don't care about these theoretical privacy risks later. Just, yeah. I don't know. I have a client right now who really wants me to find her a dumb TV because uh, you know, at first I was, she was like, you know, I think my TV is spying on me. And I'm like, all right, crazy lady. Sure. Your TV is spying on you. And then I'm like, well, what TV do you have? And uh, she tells me and I look it up and I'm like, Oh, well, no. Oh, no. Well, your TV really is spying on you. <laughs> so right. hey, I apologize. I am wrong. Yeah, exactly. I am corrected. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, that's why another thing is to get a home gateway that like blocks all this stuff. Hopefully that's another way to direction to go. Yeah. I just use another device that I can unplug when I don't want it on and there. The TV is yeah. offline, but I can still stream whatever I want to it whenever I want to. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, well, I mean, there certainly are big privacy issues, and the more you know, uh, yep, the more you got something to worry about. So then, here's this: this is the uh, the China Chinese hack, right? Or the Russian hack, right? Russian hack, yeah. So CISA uh, released some specifications to try to figure out if Russia got onto your Azure Office 365 account, um, and those uh, indicators were put into the script called Sparrow.ps1. You run this on your Azure cloud accounts, computers, and you can hopefully figure out if you have been hacked. So I just want to bring attention to this project because it is important. And hopefully we will, a lot of people are, are going to be running this soon. Yeah, because I mean, apparently the Russians were in everything for like six months. So they burrowed in deep and put many layers of stuff in it. So yeah. really, I think we'll probably never get them out entirely. But uh, yeah, any... This is, I think, every company has this problem now. How do we know whether we got hacked? Yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, I got too many links. But anyway, this one I thought was very interesting because uh, I think this is huge. We're all living in a land that is being taken over by a cult. And so this culty programmer had an interesting article. I heard a podcast with him talking about what's going on. And I must say, he's saying pretty much what I figured. I mean, people, this is something uh, Elsa Kind wrote about too. I mean, if you look at, far right wingers like QAnon people, you can't confront them by saying what you believe is false. That just makes them dig in closer. What people are doing here is they're lonely. They're all alone at home. The family's broken down. The churches are broken down. They want some group to feel like they belong to. And that's, they believe these things because it puts them in a group. And they talked about this NX IVM group, which was, you know, the typical kind of self-help sex cult where people are uh, becoming sex slaves of the leader and getting branded and stuff. And, you know, they say it's, they reach a crazy point, but you get there because you just are lonely and you want to belong to some kind of group. And anyway, it's interesting to have an analyst talk about this. And he talks about how he deprograms people from these groups. And uh, he also did it with the Moonies, which is a big one when I was young, a uh, South Korean group. And uh, so he talks about how to get people out of this. And so anyway, I think it's a huge issue. Um, for example, 83% of Republicans believe that Trump really won the election based on absolutely no facts at all, but they feel a loyalty to the Republican team, or really what they feel is a loyalty to Trump, 
And even when Trump turns on the Republicans, they just want to follow Trump wherever he goes. And I see them in these cartoons of Trump being heroic and muscular, being the only savior saving us from the world. They really believe that stuff, or at least they pretend to believe it in order to gain membership into the group of people that they feel strongly attached to. And so then the question is, Trump clearly wants to overturn democracy and become the king of America and stay in there forever. And you wonder why he's failing, because his followers love him, and the Republican establishment will not do anything to stop it. And so this person did a scientific sort of analysis of, of politics and said the thing is he's not popular enough. Erdogan did it. Putin did it in other nations, but they had like a 60 or 80 or 90 percent approval rating. And then after they won an election, they then changed the rules of elections, changed the government, declared themselves king for life, essentially, and people went along with it. And the thing about Trump is he was never above like 42 percent popularity. He was not popular enough to end American democracy, although he definitely wanted to, following in the footsteps of these um, oligarchs. So it's interesting to watch. And, you know, now the question is, is he doing it? And I am, um, uh, it's interesting to know how bad is it? Um, and here's the, uh, now they've been, this guy in the Trump team must have declared martial law and replaced the election. And a bunch of people like me say, oh, that's ridiculous. That could never happen. But, you know, they had a poll at Newsweek. And they found that, like, most people are very concerned, 51% very concerned, 23% somewhat concerned. I'm only a little concerned about him actually declaring martial law, but I'm in the minority. A lot of Americans are very worried about this. And, you know, it's, um, I uh, have Reverend Maglin is one of the ones very concerned about it on Twitter. He talks to me and says, you know, you people aren't taking it seriously, but you should be. And here's what Trump did yesterday, or no, today. He said, um, if the Democratic election was rigged and stolen, there would be an act of war and you would fight to the death. So come on January 6th and show them that you're going to save America from this. So he is actually calling for a violent revolution to put him back in power. I, I still don't take it very seriously, but other people do take it seriously. And maybe they're right. I mean, here's this article. They interview military people. And I, I certainly feel like the real military, like the Army and the Marines, would never go for this because they teach them in school about revolutions and illegal orders. But um, I think it's all just a stunt for him to make money, but um, there are a large group of people on the other side saying, I'm part of the lazy fools not taking this seriously. You shouldn't take this seriously. I'm not sure what to make of it. I guess we're gonna find out on January 6th. Anyway. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. And I'll, I'm curious, like, does this, count as treason <laughs> like i mean it seems i know sort Red of wants to have another impeachment, sort of textbook treason. Another impeachment or to call the 25th amendment but i don't think any of that is possible but they say that's how these guys get in this is following exactly what putin and other dictators did you win and then you like change the rules and claim and jail your opponents and stuff like that and stay in well, he certainly pardoned all of his cronies in the nick of time. Yeah, he's reluctant to poison people, though. I always thought he would just have to poison Biden. All you'd have to do would be to give Biden a drug that made him stupid during the debate, and he would have lost. And I don't know why he didn't do that, but he didn't. I'm Oops, surprised he that he's fighting this hard to stay president because it doesn't seem like he likes being president anyway. Yes, I think that's what's surprising everybody. I mean, now he's like vetoing these essential bills and basically holding them hostage and saying, if you don't make me president, then I'm not going to let you have any of these things you need, um, sort of going on strike. And, you know, it's nobody can predict what he's going to do. And this is what happens when you have a mad king. I mean, we're all just dragged around by him. But the fact is, the be, people love him. I would think he'd be happy he can go, like, play golf and uh, make a ton of money off of his tribe of uh followers well you know right, like why why stay and keep fighting right well a lot of americans are trying to figure out what his psychology is and apparently he really believes now that the election was stolen from him um this tends to happen to all powerful leaders so they, do a so do a surprising amount of uh of republicans believe that it was uh the the election fraud was really a thing Oh, absolutely. Like most of Republicans believe it. And that's why, you know, it's a strange point in our country. This is like at the time of the Civil War, 
or for that matter, the Vietnam War, when our country splits into two groups that don't even agree at all. Anyway, um, hopefully him and his gang will not commit too much violence and he'll just buzz off and we can have Biden come in and try to make things normal again. We will see. I keep thinking it's over, but maybe it's not over. Hopefully Biden makes things normal again. I mean, I have some, I don't, I'm I'm probably in the minority in that I uh, in California anyway in that I'm not entirely sure that when Biden get and Harris get in office that everything's going to be uh, peachy. So well, I don't think it's going to be peachy at all. I mean, Mitch McConnell has already said he's going to block everything just like he did with Obama, but I think it will not be this howling madness. I think it will just be the typical deadlocked, impotent government that can't do anything. Anyway, so Amazon Ring. Yes, getting sued. Uh, and uh, I mean, I'm, I'm all for it. Um, one thing that just, the, none of the, the only thing, there was only really one thing uh, that, that surprised me um, about this uh, in that, you know, so so the backstory is the basic backstory is that people uh, people's devices got hacked. Um, hor horrible, scary, racist things were said, um, and they were they got harassed. Uh, and essentially, um, Amazon said, "Well, that's your fault. You didn't use a strong enough password, or whatever." Um, so people got your. You know, it was probably a lot of password reuse too, though we don't know that. Uh, anyway, their defense was essentially victim blaming. What surprised me about this, the standout was that they don't force you to use uh, MFA. Um, it's it, when you use these devices, they don't make you uh, use any kind of secondary authentication factor. And I'm just like, really? Yeah. Google, you got to use it to, to access your email. Yet you have surveillance cameras in your house <laughs> that do not force you to use MFA. That's pretty bad. Yeah, well, I guess that's a good point, yeah. <coughs> so they say they're improving something. Yeah, we'll see. Likely story. <laughs> you got this cynical attitude. How could you possibly have this cynical attitude <laughs> like that? I think it might have something to do with years of uh, government employment. Yeah, it might. So <laughs> bulletproof VPNs, let's hear about this one. So bulletproof, these, they're called bulletproof VPNs only because they uh, create either ignore or fabricate excuses or just don't maintain logs. So they, they basically say we wipe our hands clean of whatever our users are doing. Uh, but these three VPNs were taken down by a number of governments because uh, they were being used for malicious purposes, like Mage Card and, and all kinds of other like hostage and ransomware. Uh, so they, they hit the VPNs. So it is a crime then to provide that service? Uh, apparently. Yeah, okay. Yeah, those servers were seized across five countries. Okay. Well, I wonder what difference that will make. Are there another hundred VPNs to take up the slack? It's not that hard to set up your own VPN server either, by the it's way. It's not. So yeah. So does that mean we're going after like Nord and and all the others? Because if they're if they don't keep logs and they have the same bulletproof thing of we wipe our hands clean of whatever our users are doing. Well, I think the big ones do take things down with a proper takedown request, just like the big hosting providers, just because they don't want this happening to them. Yeah. Gonna move domains to the gov domain. This surprised me. Yeah. So uh, as part of the recent bill that is came out of, of uh, Congress, mm -hmm. um, uh, there's a section that will let local uh, websites like your your county uh, courthouse, you know, have a .gov top level domain. Um, and so the, the idea here is to improve cybersecurity, to make it so that, you know, people can't pretend to be, you know, small city uh, services and, you know, trick people into doing stuff. And I think this is part of a larger trend we're going to see in government bills and spending is to improve um, 
cybersecurity and IT infrastructure. This is a big change. I thought the gov was only the federal government. Yeah, the, it was. It was, was like only the federal board. government. Yeah. And now it's, it's going to be for any, it can be also for local governments. Yeah. It's a big change. And it's just something that probably got overlooked in all this talk about us uh, getting our $600 for cake. Yep. Um, is this uh, .gov expansion. <laughs> yeah. Well, that'd be interesting. I'm not it'd be interesting to see if that actually improves things. I guess it might. It would make it harder to spoof a city government page if it was a .gov, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. And uh, okay, then we got COVID. I had a bunch of interesting stuff about COVID-19 treatments. Um, there's, let me just get these opened. So uh, China is making the vaccines and both China and Russia rushed out vaccines without bothering basically to do phase three trials. So you could get them out quicker. China's given them to like a million people. Um, and so there, China is the only source of a vaccine for most other nations because the expensive stuff like the Moderna the rich nations like America bought them all up. So China is the one that is providing it. So other countries can get it. It's probably their only solution. But there are some real concerns. One thing I thought was kind of interesting was they wanted to test the Chinese vaccine, and they could not test it in China because they had already defeated the virus. So there wasn't any virus going around in China. So they had to test it in Brazil, where the virus is going crazy like America. And so they tested it in Brazil where you can actually have a control group where people will get it, but they do not release the results. Like three times they were supposed to release the results, but the officials always delayed releasing the results because apparently the results are not as good as they'd hoped. So they're covering them up, but they are distributing the vaccine anyway without releasing those results, which is not a good sign. And anyway, so this one here, I thought this is very interesting. They now have direct evidence of this thing I heard of from China from a while ago that you get infected by other people in your building. If they uh, use the drains and the toilets and the bathtub, it, the fragments come back up through your drain and infect you. And wow. everybody like vertically in this pipeline chain gets infected, which I'd heard about. Because in China, they totally locked people in their house. They put another door outside your door and locked it. So you're really trapped in your house. And then people will get the virus. And they're like, how did that happen? And they find out one guy on the top floor had it. And everybody below that guy got it. Wow! So, I wonder so, if uh, I wonder if using p traps uh, change changes this at all because I know that it is uncommon to use them. And I mean, it looks like they're using it in the diagram, uh, but we don't really know because the p traps like shaped like that kind of squiggle. Yeah, like that. Well, apparently um, everybody are using these, and those don't really prevent it. Wow! I mean, the point of these was so that you don't have a bad smell coming up from your drain. Right. But of course, water doesn't really block 100% of, of fragments coming back. It just blocks, you know, like 90%. So yeah. if you're on the top floor, you're somewhat protected? Well, yes, I would think so. Yes, okay. living, like you're going to be, right, on the top yes. floor. <laughs> <laughs> That's one cheerful thought. Of course, in America, we have no control at all, so everybody's just exposed all the time. But, you know, in principle, <laughs> yes. Anyway, so that, that means a lot of people are getting exposed. Anyway, so um, another one. So I have heard about this, which was, you know, um, Mon Donald Trump and Chris Christie and his buddies got this monoclonal antibody thing, and they attributed it for making them, them say it was expensive and not available to most people. But then about a week or two ago, I saw this NIH trial that said this stuff does no good at all. These monoclonal antibodies, they tested them, and they don't do any good. But now I think more details have come out. The UK has approved it. And what they said is, once you're in the hospital and sick with corona, this stuff does you no good. The point of this stuff is it creates instant immunity. Instead of giving you a vaccine and your body builds up the immunity over the next month or so, we just inject the antibodies, artificial antibodies, straight into your body. And if you already have COVID, but you haven't gotten sick yet, like you just got exposed, this will really help. And that's how they used it on Trump. And I remember at the time they said, well, in America, it's only approved for people who are like on a ventilator and dying. And they're giving it to Trump and his gang early, which violates the American protocol. But apparently that is the correct protocol. You give it to people who are exposed, who don't even have any symptoms yet, and that causes their body to fight off the virus. So they've approved it in Britain and they're going to start shipping it out. And that is like a, uh, what you do is it's better to just give everybody the vaccine 
But if somebody is exposed and they haven't had the vaccine yet, this would be the thing. And they say it gives you about five months of immunity immediately. So anyway, it's, um, it sounds like a valuable thing. But I think there's another issue of how difficult it is to apply and how much it costs that has to be dealt with. But anyway, I'm watching a lot of exciting medical science come out of this, uh, this pandemic. And that's another thing that I bet you could apply to a lot of other things. You can just inject you with antibodies and now you're immune. You don't even have to have your body have an immune response. And of course, it's great for people who are like immune compromised or something, where a vaccine would not be safe for them. So anyway, lots of exciting stuff about the virus. And so we got uh, cryptocurrency regulations. Yeah, what was the deal with this? <laughs> yeah, so uh, they're trying to push through uh, some regulations that would force you to essentially be identified with regard to any kind of crypto transactions over 3,000, which really defeats the purpose of crypto. It used to be 10,000, right? Yes. Um, that's like the suspicious, um, that's the suspicious transaction limit, which I'd love to see some data on how much that, how much financial crime that actually catches because it seems stupid and arbitrary and I doubt it actually catches much of anything because everyone who's doing anything bad knows that. So, uh, they just break up the transactions or do it in other ways or, you know, become the president. And I mean, you know, they're, I'm not entirely, I'm not entirely convinced that that's an effective means of preventing crime. But, um, and this just seems like the same deal where they would, uh, require the crypto exchanges to, uh, maintain, um, uh, an identification database of their users, which is problematic for multiple reasons. So, uh, and of course, they push this, they push this through right before uh, Christmas, as they like to do. And there's like a, a two-week um, period for people to weigh in on it, uh, for however that much counts for anyway. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if this goes through. It's not approved yet then. Correct. Okay. Because I mean, basically, this is the whole, this is the whole thing with the internet disrupting technology. Like Uber is basically there to break the um, taxi cab industry and evade the regulations that make taxi cabs so expensive. And Airbnb is to break the hotel industry and cryptocurrency is to break the financial industry. And uh, it, they're basically just um, anarchist rebellions where you say you don't need any of those regulations. And, uh, I think in the case of cryptocurrency, they're wrong and you really do need all those regulations, but we're going to see. Well, I don't, the other thing is, is that when you read the, um, you read the uh, memo from uh, the uh, Financial Crimes Enforcement Network where they're laying out the uh, proposed rules, um, they talk about uh, wallets that are held under a, a jurisdiction that's governed by them. So I don't see why you wouldn't just offshore all the exchanges then. Because that's certainly one option. There's no way to enforce it then. Well, but the point is you get them where you turn it into real dollars. The exchange is the point. You can do something in cryptocurrency, but when you actually change it to dollars, then you're actually a bank. And, it, and I think... Um, if you put it out of the country, then you have no legal recourse. If you're an American using it, they can just steal your money. You can't do anything. So they can do that now. <laughs> I mean, well, if Coinbase was to steal your money, you could sue them. They're in America. You could actually take them to court and get your money back. Theoretically. Well, I think they would go for it. Coinbase is really determined to be the legal, reputable Bitcoin exchange. They've and been. I was moving all my money to Switzerland. Well, uh, you know, Elon Musk wants to put all his money in Bitcoin. That might happen. We'll see. But he's kind of a madman. Anyway, so we got a crypto bundle. Yep. Another hum humble bundle. Yep. Uh, from these guys. A lot of uh, interesting books like the Shell Coders Handbook. Yeah. Uh, there's the web one, but I would, I would rather uh, direct people to the Web Security Academy. Uh, it's further down. Oh, here. Uh, where is it? Not that one. Further down. Yeah, there. Okay. Oh, Web application one. hacker sample. Yeah. Yeah. 
I'd rather direct people to the uh, Web Security Academy. It's more updated than that book. Uh, but you know, another another bundle for people who are interested and, and want to read over the holidays. Yeah. yeah, and of course, I'm teaching this course next semester, and I just threw away all my projects because the free um, projects that Caitlin and I have started doing are so much better. The uh, the free projects from Portswigger are wonderful. Yep. They are. They are amazing. Uh, I mean, and it's it's so fun too because they. Uh, I'm used to you know going and doing these large boxes that take hours and hours to do. You go on Portswigger, and they just have like 127 activities and each one of them only takes like 10 or 20 minutes at the most assuming you're not you know i can't uh, you know trying to figure it out yourself yeah i oh, use my these in my, in my classes too yeah, i'm going to throw this on the page to do this is really great i'm going to totally do this i've got you know i've done like the first few of them and they're very good the only thing is they're not sorted in any logical order so if you just do them the order they're presented the first couple are too difficult so i'm just going to tell my students to start with the easy ones but this is great stuff Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I've noticed that too, even even in the order of the, the so it's presented in terms of type, and then I, I assume it gets harder as it goes down, but um, even the types themselves, like sometimes, like one of the more difficult types is like right in the middle, and then like you have easier types after that. I mean, it's all over yeah. the place. You know, I tried to just do the easy ones, and this is what I ended up doing. They don't even tell you with their apprentice practitioner expert, somehow some of the ones I'm doing are a higher level and you don't even know. So, you know, that's a minor defect. I, I love the fact that it's easy. There are instructions and they have all the servers set up so you can do it. This is fantastic. It's just not quite set up for the convenience of a college course, but you can't have everything. Yeah. Yeah. I do like that Burp Suite now you can do the, you have the web interface within the tool. Yeah, I love that. You know, that used to be clumsy when I first found this and I used it in my classes. I had to spend a good time helping students build the, that infrastructure for them. But now, yeah. yeah, they can all do it all within the tool. I love that. I know Burp is so much better. So obviously this Portswigger company is doing great. I hope they keep this stuff free because I'm really going to start using it. Yeah, me oh, too. It's so much better than my attempt to build the imitation of this over the last several years. Their stuff is so great. And I'm hoping if I dorm all this, I can start running more bug bounties. So that would be fun. But anyway, that may not happen. But anyway, if nothing else, at least my students will get more up-to-date information. So what did GoDaddy do? Oh, yeah, this one. Oh, yeah, they had this. a phishing test. <laughs> and this is so, outrageous. <laughs> yeah, no, this is ridiculous. Yeah, so what they did is they sent out emails uh, from GoDaddy.com, no less. Okay, saying that, oh, we're, we're going to give you a bonus because, you know, it's been a hard year of $650, which isn't outrageous. And uh, people clicked it and entered their stuff. And the email they got back was, uh-oh, you just failed our phishing attempts. <laughs> if like, you wanted to destroy company morale, yeah. this is what you would do to a company. <laughs> like, yeah. this is like modern Ebenezer Scrooge. <laughs> like, like, you know what, sure, attackers would totally do something like that. But just because an attacker would try to do something doesn't mean you have the authority to do it too. Like, and if an attacker really wanted to get into your building, they could put a gun up to somebody. <laughs> like, give me your badge. You don't have the right to, to harass or make your, you know, empl employees feel bad. You know? Well, I think you have the legal right, but it's obviously a terrible way to motivate your employees to love your company, you know. That's why I've heard people that are in the business of doing like uh, social engineering training say, you never do this. You never punish people and make them feel bad. What you do is you offer a prize for people who, yes. who do the good thing. You don't yeah. hit everybody. You bad person. <laughs> we know that negative reinforcement isn't a real great way to train anyone. Uh, it doesn't even work on animals, like let alone human animals. I mean, the first thing I would think is, why am I working for this company? Let me brush up my resume. I mean, why, why do I work for people that treat me like this? Which is yeah. a feeling we get a lot working in community colleges. Why am I working for a company that treats me like this? <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you know, just think about, you know, if you're running tests, you're running red teaming tests, think about what you're doing to the person on the other side. I mean, I know it's easy to get, you know, locked into your goals and figuring out how do I do this or do that, but really think about the customer. You know? Yeah, all the professionals I know in the business have talked about, you know, 10 years ago, they called users losers and said, the problem is users messing everything up and we hate the users. And they said, you know, it's time to grow past that. That is not a productive way to deal with the situation. You have to like, treat people with respect 
and guide them to a better security posture in a positive way. <laughs> right. It's a major logic fail to think that fostering a negative association with uh, in, for security training is in any remote way a good idea. And I remember when I got my first teaching job, the, the people that are established do not understand how troubling it is to jerk you around about issues of money and employment. I remember they dangle something in front of you, you can have a full-time job, and then they jank it away. And then they say, why are you upset? I say, dude, this really matters. I remember I was so disgusted. I just threw everything in the trash out of my office and stormed off. It's, you don't mess with people's job or promotion or money because it really matters. There are people who really need that money and it is not a funny joke for them to jerk them around about money. Very true. Yeah, especially yeah. especially now. I mean, I know. if if there ever were there if there were ever a, a an extra compelling time not to do this, it's now. I know. <laughs> I mean, what I would do is I would make it something not very important, like there's going to be a party or something, or something about the parking. That's what I always thought would really do it at City College. City College for a long time kept having construction in the parking lots. And so they would change something about the parking stickers. And that was like really important and people will click on the links, but at least then they won't hate you when they find out it's not true. Anyway. Anyway, that's uh, pretty gruesome stuff. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's all of mine. There was one extra Liz had one. Yes. I had this. So th this was another thing that was tacked on to the stimulus bill that uh, is not so great, uh, not so helpful. So you know, and this is just another reminder that when bills are passed through Congress, there's always a bunch of extras tacked on that have nothing to do uh, with the original um, issue being an issue at hand. And these riders uh, that get tacked on can can get pretty crazy. And uh, so this this was sponsored by a uh, Republican senator out of um, North Carolina who got a ton of money from um, Comcast and some of the other uh, big players. And I, I, believe, I believe it was co-sponsored by um, a Democrat as well, um, who probably also got payoffs, but I, I didn't look into that uh, that far. But essentially this, uh, this is just another. Um, this is just another way to um, implement copyright trolling uh, right now, and to uh, criminalize um, to criminalize this stuff. And uh, it's really not. It's really not a good move. Not a great time to do that. Um, I read an article that said it would only affect like people that did a huge amount of copyright piracy, but now I'm not seeing that. Yeah, yeah, theoretically, but I'm not so sure. They they also pulled numbers out of. I'd love to know where they got this this number saying that uh, that illegally distributing copyrighted materials costs the U.S. thirty billion dollars every year. Well, that's uh, easy. You take the number of movies on BitTorrent, multiply it by the retail price of the movie, it's totally fake, you know, as if yeah. people are all going to buy it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but then, I mean, that makes a good soundbite for you to push your agenda forward. So yeah. um, it's pretty gross. I'm pretty, um, I mean, you know, these, I really hope something, anything good happens with the FCC now that uh, Ajit Pai is on his way out. Um because it's it's bad. I mean, Comcast is just running totally unchecked right now, and and just yeah, doing more and more horrible things. As long you know, the more they can get away with, the more they're doing it because there's no um, there's no oversight there. So and you know, you know, I think I think I watched this happen over the last few decades. It, I it's a far better business model to actually make something good that people are willing to pay for than to sue and punish your customers into paying more for stuff. You know, it's, yeah. anyway, it's like we were saying about the fishing. There's a way to make your business positive where people pay and they love you because you give them something good instead of like beating them with a stick and robbing them. 
Right. And it's not a one size fits all thing either. This is going to punish a lot of like independent YouTubers and stuff. And the companies that are behind this are the megacorps, you know, like Disney yeah. and Comcast and whatnot, who are having record profits right now. So it's like, they just really want to exert their um, financial influence through politics and clamp down on everything to make it, you know, a totalitarian situation where, uh, you know, I, I don't know how we got from don't copy that floppy to uh, throw people in prison for a felony over, over pirating media, but that's, that's where we are right now. <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, all right. Did we get them all? I sometimes skip them. I think so. Okay. Well, good. Any more comments? I'll stop this one.